Women's History Month. I want to welcome you all to the 26th annual City of Tampa Women's History Month celebration. My name is Emerald Morrow, and I am a reporter and anchor at 10 Tampa Bay, Channel 10. And it is so important that we celebrate and honor the contributions that women have made to society for so long Women have not had the equal opportunity to do some of the things that we just all take for granted today. So it is truly my honor to stand before you today as we celebrate all of the many wonderful contributions that women have made to this community. Now, I want to take first a moment to reflect upon how March became to be known as Women's History Month. 43 years ago, in March of 1980, it doesn't seem like 43 years ago, does it? <laughs> the National Women's History Alliance was formed to honor the accomplishments of women. And in 1987, Congress formally declared the month of March as Women's History Month. Ten years later, the city of Tampa established its Women's History Month Committee and each year, this is a committee that recognizes an outstanding female employee with the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award. Now, this recipient of this award is chosen based on her merits, as well as her embodiment of the National Women's History Project theme. And this year, for 2023, the theme is Women Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Sarah McNamara, embodies this theme by telling women's stories in her upcoming book, Ybor City, Crucible of the Latina South, which will be released on April 11th. We look forward to hearing from her a little bit later on in this program. But now I do want to ask that everyone please stand for the presentation of Colors mm -hmm. by members of the Tampa Police Department Honor Guard, followed by our national anthem sung by the Tampa Fire Rescue Hometown Heroes Chorus. We will wrap things up with the Pledge of Allegiance and an inspirational message from Harley Williams, who is a member of the Mayor's Youth Corps. Then. Oh. oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hear? At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the red ones we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red light. They prove through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, say that the stars fading off and that wave for the land. Oh, oh. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Hold on. Oh. We gather today as a diverse body of people from many faiths and traditions. We may not speak the same language of worship, we may follow different teachings, and yet we gather today in celebration of the women who tell our stories. In our gathering, we honor and seek and appreciate our diversity. We do not seek a unity that would deny our differences. We rather seek a deeper union, a union woven together through choice and intent, through time and intention, respect and compassion, until we recognize that we have become a whole cloth, a cloth made rich and textured and vibrant through our differences. Each of us can hear, in the beating of our own hearts, the ancient rhythm of the loom at work. We are woven together. We are bound to one another. We belong to and with, us, with each other. Let us celebrate together. I just want to say something real quick about that, what she said. As a news reporter, we often cover the very worst in society. And to see a young woman who is focused on her future, so bright and articulate in front of us all, is something to be commended. So let's give her a hand, again, for her contribution. And I've got to say, that Hometown Heroes chorus was something else, wasn't it? <laughs> and a few words about Harley. She's a junior who attends Blake High School, where she's actively, yeah, Blake, give it a minute. There you go, there you go. Where she's actively immersed in her theater performance major. When she isn't on stage, she loves volunteering so much so that she holds the position of Key Club Vice President. She's a member of the 2023 Tampa Mayor Youth Corps. Yes. <laughs> Which she says is the most exciting opportunity for her thus far. Now the program will introduce her to gaining some insightful knowledge on how city government works, which we know is all very important. And this is gonna be useful for her further plans to work in government communications as a public information officer. So prepare because maybe in a few years I'll be giving you a call for some interviews and things like that. Best of luck to you, Harley, in all of your current and future endeavors. This year's Women History Month theme, Women, Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories honors women who not only chronicle history through mediums such as radio and television, but also through traditions and customs that are passed down through the generations. So at this time, we would like to recognize the women who have dedicated a significant amount of time to their careers to the city of Tampa. Would all female employees who've worked at the city of Tampa for more than 20 years, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> That's quite the accomplishment. We thank you for your service to this great city. We would now like to acknowledge our elected officials and guests. We're going to acknowledge some people who are here in the room today. Julie Stafford. Mm -hmm. 
Wanda West, assistant to Gwen Myers, Commissioner Gwen Myers. <laughs> Della Curry, assistant to Harry Cohen, Commissioner Cohen. <laughs> Councilman Guido Maniscalco. <laughs> Interim TPD Chief Burkhoff, Chief Burkhoff. <laughs> Women's History Committee sponsor, Brad Baird. <laughs> Chief Barbara Tripp. <laughs> She's also a Women's History Committee member as well. And Sandy Friedman. <laughs> Former honoree and, of course, the first female mayor of the city of Tampa. <laughs> TPD Deputy Chief Mike Hutner. <laughs> Deputy Chief Calvin Johnson. Hillsborough County Tax Collector, Nancy Milan. <laughs> Hillsborough County Public Defender, Julianne Holt. <laughs> and State Attorney, Susan Lopez. <laughs> We've also got Councilman Josie Cho in the house. <laughs> and E.J. Salcinas. <laughs> Big names in the house today. Also, State Representative Diane Hart. Did I miss anybody? If, if there's anybody else in the house that we miss, please stand. Josephine's niece is here from Colorado Springs. All right. Welcome. Janice Howard Webster. Thank you. I can't see who we're pointing to back here. Cindy Stewart, Clark of Court, Cindy Stewart. Former Hillsborough County School Board member as well. <laughs> all right, thank you all for your service. Now, there have been 26 recipients of the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award over the years, and we want to now recognize all of the former honorees who are here with us today, including any members of Josephine Howard Stafford's family. So if you're a previous recipient of the award, <laughs> please stand. That is awesome. So we know that we are among greatness with all of these women who have been honored for their contributions to this community. So again, we thank you all. Now to bring us greetings on behalf of Tampa City Council, Councilwoman Lynn Hurtock, representing District 3 at large. Now this is the first time in a few years that a woman's been on City Council to present the Women's History Month commendation. So that's a big deal for us. Amanda Lynn Hartock earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Florida. She worked as a teacher at Idlewild Elementary School in Gainesville, while also serving as the school's union representative. She currently works as a technical editor, focusing on aid programs in West Africa. She's been an old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association trustee, a member of Tampa's Variance Review Board, and a member of the Charter Review Commission. Please welcome Councilwoman Hurtock. Thank you so much. Uh, I am so excited to be here um, with this packed room. Um, I have been working on women's issues since I can remember, since I was in high school. Uh, I joined the National Organization for Women and have actively participated uh, for so many years. And I'm so glad to see our city support women. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, today I have a commendation. Um, 
presented to the City of Tampa's 26th Annual Women's History Month celebration. Tampa City Council proudly recognizes the City of Tampa's 26th Annual Women's History Month celebration on March 1st, 2023 at the Tampa Bay History Center and acknowledges the outstanding efforts of the 2023 Women's History Month Committee. Raise your hand if you're part of that committee. Yeah. Thank you. Declared nationwide, Women's History Month is a tribute to the generations of women whose commitment and contributions have proven invaluable in our nation's history and contemporary society. Tampa City Council salutes the Women's History Month Committee for their work to highlight our own community leaders. Each year, the committee works to recognize a Tampa, City of Tampa female employee who has demonstrated an outstanding commitment to her position and to the City of Tampa. Thank you for your exceptional work for our community and city as we honor the extraordinary and remarkable women of Tampa for their contributions and accomplishments. Thank you so much for that. And it is now my honor to introduce the one, the only mayor of the city of Tampa, <laughs> a previous recipient of the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award. Jane Castor is the 59th mayor of the city of Tampa and she's homegrown Tampa native who graduated from Chamberlain High School and the University of Tampa. Upon graduation, she joined the Tampa Police Department and worked her way up to being appointed Tampa's first female chief of police. Let's just, in that in and of itself, a round of applause. We know that's not an easy feat at all. Now in 2019, Mayor Castor was elected mayor of the city of Tampa and she's hoping that in about a week, <laughs> She'll be elected once again. <laughs> Her platform is based on lifting up every neighborhood by enhancing workforce development, improving infrastructure and mobility, and increasing affordable housing options. We know that is such a huge issue in our community right now. She's also championed the apprenticeship ordinance to boost the middle class and has also raised the city of Tampa minimum wage to $15 an hour. She's also been really big on promoting women to positions in leadership. Women now occupy more than half of the leadership spots within the city. More than half, that's huge. Mayor Castor has also worked on making it safer to walk to work and to get to school. She's worked with city council to close the developer sidewalk loophole and has worked on creating more sidewalks near schools. We know that's also very, very important. Vision Zero is a big part of what she does as well. And she's directing her team to enhance programs like crosswalk to classrooms and installing more bike lanes and four-way stops. And again, as we talked about affordable housing, she has pledged to build 10,000 more affordable units by 2027. She says that subsidies alone will not solve our community's housing needs. And that's why she has worked to reestablish the city's planning, develop, planning department to implement smart growth policies. She's also been working with city council to modernize the zoning code. And she says this is going to create more opportunities for missing middle housing and mixed use development. So it is my honor to welcome to introduce again, the one, the only Jane Castor, mayor of the city of Tampa. Thank you so much, Emerald. I have a, um, a little bit of a sinus infection. So your introduction may be longer than my comments. <laughs> But uh, it is so exciting for me to be here right now. It warms my heart to see standing room only for this event that really is a signature 
uh, within the city of Tampa, being, being able to recognize the impact that women have had throughout history on the city of Tampa. Now, before I start, I have to say thank you to Brad Baird. I know that he was one of the initial uh, sponsors of this event and has continued for all through the years. So thank you, thank you, Brad, for all that you have done. <clears throat> you know, but this does provide us with a unique opportunity to recognize the impact that women have had on the history of Tampa and on the entire Tampa Bay region. And it's something, you know, when I became, was elected mayor, uh, that when you open up that that viewfinder and you look literally for the most qualified individual to do the job, you'd be amazed at what you find. And so I fortunately have found a lot of very, very qualified women to be in leadership positions here in the city of Tampa. And we're so excited to have Lynn Hurtak on uh, city council, again, to have a woman, nothing against uh, my, my other male council friends, but a woman's perspective is always wonderful, right? Yes, without a doubt. But we have um, Chief Barbara Tripp. I did not know Barbara Tripp. Uh, I know she brought her own cheering section. I love that. But I did not know Barbara Tripp until I was asked, after I retired, I was asked to be the keynote speaker for this event. And Barbara Tripp uh, was named the Josephine Stafford Award winner. And uh, she got up and she first said, I'm not used to um, public presentations, and then proceeded to give the best speech I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, I need to know this person. And so that, you know, those are the kind of things we have so many individuals, men and women, in the city of Tampa that just need that recognition and need that opportunity. Um, looking at, I know was said, the, the number of women in our staff, and I know I'll miss a few people, but Andrea Zellman uh, back here, Kate Wells. We have our administrator, uh, Nicole Travis, Jean Duncan, Osea Wynn, four, three out of four of our administrators. Um, Shirley Fox Knowles, our clerk of the court, uh, Abby Feely, Sharisha Hills, Adri Colina. I mean, just so many women that are a part of not only the fabric of our community, at, but are building our city day by day. And the important thing about that is the example that's being set for the future generations. I had, uh, many of you have heard me tell the story when I was a police chief, a woman stopped me at um, a breakfast uh, one morning and she said, I just have to tell you, my daughter saw you on the news this morning and she said, mom, is that really the police chief? And she said, yes, it is. And she goes, wow, I can be anything I want to be. So I would say to women in leadership positions, and that means every woman in this room, to always understand the example that you present and the impact that you can make on another young person's life. And to all the young women in the room, what I tell you is that you have what it takes. Have the confidence and the belief in yourself to reach for the stars and you can accomplish anything that you want to accomplish. It was such an honor for me to win the Josephine Stafford Award. I did not know uh, your mother, Julie, but Gina Grimes, a uh, very good friend of mine, uh, talked to me about her for several hours. And I tell you, I was like, Oh, my gosh, did I want to know this woman? My dad would have called her a character, and I think that's probably the best word to use to describe her. But I'm sorry that I didn't get to know her, but I, I hope that I live up to um, her legacy without a doubt. And I know that uh, Mary Bryan, our, our winner this year, is without a doubt most deserving, having served our city for 60 years, but uh, I know, that's why I said, I don't want to put it in context, but I was three years old, all right? I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. So anyway, um, but she said that, that she never wanted the, the accolade, didn't want to be 
um, nominated for this award because uh, having Josephine as her best friend was uh, more than enough reward for her. So I think that that couldn't be a, a, a better way to, to honor your mother's uh, legacy. So I think now I'm supposed to give the proclamation before my voice gives out. <laughs> and Kayon Henderson, I, I know she's coming up here. I just love my Kayon. And she was the winner last year, so she's going to introduce Mary which um, I thought I was going to have the honor of doing, but that's okay. <laughs> Kayon, Kayon can do it because I'm sure she'll do a much better job than I ever could. So if I could have, come on up. In this um, proclamation, a lot of what um, Emerald said that, you know, in uh, 1987, which was way too late, uh, the U.S. Um, United States Congress named the month of March as Women's History Month in recognition of the many contributions women have made to our country's history and heritage. And then we have had our celebration, as, I, as was stated before, uh, for 26 years. And with the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award, and I don't know that there are any other, there may be a few awards and recognitions that deserve the same status, but I know that there are no, none uh, more important than this. And this year's winner, 2023, is Mary Bryan, as I stated. And I can say in my four years of reading proclamations, I have never seen a whereas this wide of <laughs> all the things that Mary has been involved in in her time. Now, granted, she's had a lot more years than the rest of us have. We'll have to give her that part without a doubt. But I tell you, there isn't a cause in this city that Mary Bryan has not been involved in. So I just want to say to the Women's History Committee, thank you. I know this is a, a, a heavy lift, but you make it look effortless. So our appreciation and recognition to everyone on the Women's History Committee and Mary Bryan, well deserved for a job well done. Thank you, my friend. You guys make me look good. I get a bitch. Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Lynn, you guys want to come up? <clears throat> Can you get everybody? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Kasser. Let's give another round of applause. So we're going to continue with the praise for Mary Bryan. So we have a, a special presentation to share with you about our Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award recipient. So we want you to please turn your attention to the screen for a little video about this trailblazing woman. I'd nickname, I'd nickname her 1-800-CALL-MARY. When she's there, she's in charge. When I'm there, she's still in charge. Mary is tenacious. When she grabs onto something, it's like a Walt Ryder fighting with a minnow. Minnow's not gonna win. I've only applied for two jobs my whole life. On the same day, I applied at the city of Tampa and I applied at Bush Gardens. And I really wanted Bush Gardens because it was only a block from my house. But the city called first. I stayed with the city and I surely am glad I did. We're in this business of helping people. The thing that makes me the happiest is that we have so many women department heads. It was a long time coming. I'd like for you one day to listen to Mary's phone. They always call back to say, that lady did a fantastic job. And she was so pleasant on the phone. It's not how often you do something is how often you start with something and see it through. You should try the very hardest to help the people. I guess we'll give the lights a second to come on here. No, no, it's going to dark. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
No, right? Okay, there we go. Let there be light. Sort of, maybe. <laughs> we'll continue with the program. There we go. Let there be light. <laughs> So it is time now for us to actually present the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award to Mary Bryan. Now we want to kind of talk about this a little bit more in detail. This award was established to honor a current or former city of Tampa female employee who demonstrates outstanding commitment to her position and to this community. This award recognizes a woman who has made great strides in her profession. And it is given in honor of Ms. Stafford, who devoted 24 years to the city of Tampa as an assistant city attorney. She was an advocate for women's issues, both professionally and in the community. In 2015, Ms. Stafford was inducted into the Hillsborough County Women's Hall of Fame. So this year, 15 talented women were nominated for the Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award. And we would like to recognize all who were nominated at this time. So would all of the nominees for this award please stand. Got a few more. Congratulations to you all. We have one more, I think, in the back. A couple more. We don't want to miss anybody. Congratulations to you all. Now, I would like to welcome last year's Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award recipient, City of Tampa Housing and Community Development Manager, Kayon Henderson, who will be introducing this year's honoree. Good morning, everyone. So I want to start by saying it's a pleasure to introduce Mary Bryan. She's made very late night council meetings seem like a pleasure. <laughs> Um, she's always bringing a joy to everything she does, and to say I am honored to share the stage with you is an understatement. So I'll give a brief history of everything that Mary's done, and by brief I mean about four pages. <laughs> um, so Mary is a legislative aide for Charlie Miranda um, as the 2023 Josephine Howard Stafford Memorial Award winner. With 60 years of service, she holds the record for being the longest serving City of Tampa employee, even though she looks extremely young still doing it. <laughs> Mary began her unparalleled career with the City of Tampa at the age of 17. Following her high school graduation, she began working in the Office of Urban Renewal in 1962, which was later reorganized as Housing and Community Services. Her talents and hard work and demeanor were easily recognized, and her abilities were often sought after. She was a trusted grants writer in the Revenue and Finance Department under Louis Russo. Quick learning, reliable, and tenacious, Mary was elevated to the legal department as an assistant to the city attorney, James Palermo. Mary continued to assist the legal department until 2011. In 2011, she took a 24-hour break. <laughs> and returned as the city council aide to Charlie Miranda, where she continues to serve. From 1962 to 2023, Mary has served under 11 different mayors of Tampa. She has, um, Mary's also given her support to the Spring of Tampa Bay, the American Heart Association, March of Dimes, United Way of Tampa Bay, the Dress for Success Program, the Humane Society, Tampa Police Department and Tampa Fire Rescue Beneficent Appeals, to name a few. She was also involved in the Teens Engaged in Community Boys and Girls Club of Tampa Bay, Career Experience Program for the City Attorney's Office, and Mayor Friedman's Committee on Youth Opportunities. For more than 20 years, Mayor has also set up the holiday decorations at C Old City Hall. Mary received the Mayor's Youth Employment Award for Summer Jobs Campaign, as well as the Citizens Award from Sheriff David G. 
of Hillsborough County. Mary has tirelessly given of herself for over 60 years. She's been a friend and a mentor to countless city elected officials, employees, and citizens. I started off by saying it's a pleasure to work with Mary. Um, always a smiling face. I can't say I'm giving this award to anybody more deserving um, than Mary this year. I would also then like to turn it over to our own Shiro, who turns visions into goals, Mayor Castor, to help to present this award. Mary's a little nervous. I know you all find that hard to believe. Thank you. Well, wow, this is so exciting. <laughs> anyway, I watched her grow up, so that's good, and a few others. So she may can make. She's allowed to make a few jokes about me. Um, I wanted to thank you for, um, sorry, I might have to read. I'm nervous. Um, thank you for being here and sharing this honor with me. My friend and boss, Charlie Miranda, couldn't be here today. Um, but he is, I saw that. Um, <laughs> but his support and well wishes are with me, I'm sure. The first thing I must um, do is say how surprised and grateful I am. Thank you to the people that um, nominated me, and I think I'm gonna mention your name in a minute. Um, there are so many other people um, that who, who merit this award, and I actually look forward to being here in a few more years and, <laughs> and um, honoring them for the year. If I started to name them and through nervousness, I might miss somebody, and that would be hurtful to me. But I must point one shining star in my life, and that's my loving daughter, Dr. Deborah Brian Lorino, who is here with me today, with along with my, one of my granddaughters, Lucy. Yep. Lucy's a super st soccer star. Um, and to the rest of my friends, I must say thank you for your help, your support, and your friendship over these years. In particular, I owe my presence here today um, to the efforts of my friends and coworkers, Jorge Martin, Della Curry, um, Gina Grimes, one of the best city attorneys ever, <laughs> Sal Torito as well, Michelle Miles, and Carincia. There you are. Consegra. I practiced that. Okay. As I think about my time in the city, I remember early on how I began to put a little bit of my paycheck aside into the city's deferred plan. Everybody should be doing that. And I do mean a little bit because in those days, I only made about a dollar an hour. <laughs> but you would be surprised at how quickly that money accumulated over the years and as it turned out, it was an important step in my early years. And I do, to this day, talk to new employees about the importance of setting aside money. Those funds proved to be helpful in my life due to some health issues that occurred with my husband, Jack. That is why I often make the suggestion to new employees whenever I get the opportunity, because you never know what life has in store for you. Mm -hmm. um, I have always endeavored throughout my life and career to help others in any way possible. That desire to help others has allowed me to treat every person's concern in helpful, honest, and forthright manner. Each day I look forward to assisting whomever I come into contact with, and I approach each encounter with kindness. That's important. 
I sincerely encourage every city employee to do that. It's so rewarding. During my career with the city, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Josephine Howard Stafford and enjoying our relationship. In fact, she became my best friend. She was, as we all know it, a powerful force. I don't think she was afraid of anything or anyone. I remember sharing a walk to the courthouse for a hearing one day, and she sang, Onward, Christian Soldiers, Marching as to War, including all the verses, all three blocks to the courthouse. She said, I want to be prepared to fight on behalf of the city that I love, and she always did. You all probably know Josephine was the first woman municipal judge. She would don her robe and march from the second floor of Old City Hall to the courtroom over the police station that was located in our courtyard where the mayor parks. It was the police department there, believe it or not, and a holding tank. But anyway, actually, <laughs> actually, if you look up over the back entrance where, the, where you enter Old City Hall, you'll see the doors that would fly open and she'd walk across the walkway to the courthouse. Just a little piece of ancient history. Every new lawyer in our office, I had a red pen, but I lost it. But anyway, every new lawyer in our office began with meeting Josephine and having her take a look at what they were working on. And almost everyone left with an unamended document filled with red pen markings. <laughs> Brad Baird will say, but I was the buffer between him and Josephine. <laughs> and every, but everyone knew that Brad was her favorite. <laughs> no offense, Julie. <laughs> Actually, you know quite well we all heard about every single accomplishment you ever made. She was so proud of you, and so am I. Mm. Julie is a strong woman like Josephine and so smart. Both and a smart aleck sometimes. Both, <laughs> both of her parents were strong, determined individuals, and she is as well. I'm almost done. Josephine always had ideas. She insisted that we join the French club, um, started by her neighbor. Imagine that. Neither of us knew a word of French. Still don't. <laughs> Thank you, Leanna, for that. Um, she gave me that word. Anyway, um, There's a picture in the back um, of the French Club. And so the reason why I, I'm bringing that up is that we believe that that club initiated the um, movement to naming the sister city Le Havre. So there's some history right there. So in closing, let me again extend my sincere gratitude for the honor you have bestowed on me. Heartfelt thanks and gratitude. And now it's time for all of us to go out and help others and be kind in the spirit of Josephine Howard Stafford. Thank you. Now, come back up, Mary, because the accolades aren't over. <laughs> At this time, we would like to present you with a congratulatory letter from Governor Ron DeSantis. I should read this out loud. Wow. <laughs> Says, Ms. Dear Ms. Bryan, it is my pleasure to congratulate you on 60 years of service to the city of Tampa. I understand you started your career with the city in 1962 as a secretary in the legal department and currently work as a legislative aide. Your enthusiasm and kind spirit is invaluable to your colleagues and the people you serve. There is no doubt that your hard work and dedication has served as an inspiration and example to your office and beyond. I appreciate your dedicated service and loyalty to Tampa and to our great state. Keep up the great work. Best wishes for your continued success. Sincerely, Ron DeSantis, Governor. She is clearly very, very well loved. All right. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, a woman whose career has defined 
what it means to be a trailblazer by telling women's stories. <laughs> Dr. Sarah McNamara is an historian, she's a professor, and a Tampa native whose research and writing examines the histories of women and gender, immigration, and labor in Florida. She's published work about Ybor City, Tampa, and Florida widely. Her work has appeared in journals such as the Journal of American Ethnic History, Labor, Studies in Working Class History, as well as the edited volume, 50 Events That Shape Latino History. She's given talks across the entire country and has been named a Mellon Emerging Faculty Leader by the Institute for Citizens and Scholars at Princeton University, as well as a faculty fellow by the American Association of University Women. She's received recognition for her innovative work in the classroom, as well as support for her research from sources such as the American Historical Association and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Her first book, Ybor City, Crucible of the Latina South, examines the history of three generations of Latinas who lived, labored, and fought to survive in Ybor and broader Tampa. This history, inspired by the experiences of the author's family, unveils this very much so underexplored role of women's leadership within movements for social and economic justice. At present, she is at work on a local public history project to celebrate the work of Latinas by uniting historic markers with artistic murals. Please welcome Dr. Sarah. McNamara. Well, good morning, everyone. We're about to see how short I am. <laughs> it is an honor to join you all today and to celebrate the work of the women who shape and have shaped the city of Tampa. But more than anything, this event doesn't happen without every single one of you who's sitting in the, off, in the audience. One thing that we often forget to do, specifically as women, myself included, right, hearing that bio makes me want to do nothing other than shrivel, <laughs> is to recognize our achievements. So regardless of if you were a nominee for an award, if you are receiving an award today, I want us all to take a moment and recognize that we are all sitting in a space and celebrating women in a way that would have been nearly impossible to do 50 years ago. And remember that when you forget to give yourself credit. <laughs> So today is the first day of Women's History Month, and it provides the opportunity to reconsider and rethink what women's history means and to question who makes history. History, many people assume, and especially my students, think of it as something that happened to someone else a long time ago, right? This version of history, it's stagnant and stuffy, it's opaque and it's boring, and it's something to be memorized rather than something to be understood. But in my profession, from my research to my writing to my teaching to my speaking, it is this stereotype of history that I work to overcome. As I tell my students and the thing that I want you all to think about today and to remember as you leave this room, it is that History is personal and historical representation matters. Each year, each semester, no matter which class I'm teaching, my goal is for every single student who is sitting in my room to see themselves in the stories they learn. At the beginning of the semester, I ask them what questions they have or who they wish to learn about or what they don't know, and that is a part of lecture or it becomes a part of something that we discuss. Because when students leave and when you see yourself and when you understand the things that you don't have context for, something isn't just a moment that is happening right now, it's part of a process that has been ongoing and something that has the ability to change who we are. History is not simply the story of what happened, 
but it is the story of who we all are. Women's history, the work of women's historians, right? Because ironically enough, you don't get women's history without women becoming professors and then writing women's histories, <laughs> right? And Women's History Month presents an opportunity to understand women as they were and to see ourselves in histories. My path to writing my first book, Ybor City, Cruzable de la Latina South, as Emerald so kindly introduced, which will be released in 42 days. It has been a long haul, so I'm very excited. It began by asking questions about myself and about my community. So asking questions about Tampa. These personal questions led me to a big story that at times I am still surprised people across the nation are interested in learning. My story and the story of the history I wrote begins in a very humble place, sitting beside and listening to my grandmother, Norma Alfonso Blanco. For as long as I can remember, my grandmother was on a one-woman mission to be sure my sister and I knew what it meant to be from and of Ybor City. She took us on tours of the old neighborhood, she told us stories about our families, and she kept traditions alive. The work she did made sure Ebor lived in me and within my sister. And I'm sure there's many of you in the audience who do much of that same work, whether or not your histories are written down, but through the stories that you know. My grandmother was born in 1931, and into a moment in Ebor's history we rarely discuss, the moment the Cuban cigar industry declined. While I'm sure most of us in the room know that Ybor City was the Cuban cigar making capital of the world and responsible for two thirds of the industrial output of the state of Florida by the turn of the 20th century, most of us do not give much thought to how all of that changed. It changed or it started to change with the Great Depression. The Great Depression, which began in 1929 and lasted through the 1930s and really ended with World War II, radically transformed Ybor as well as the broader city. The roughly 200 cigar factories that once fueled Tampa's economy began to shutter in their early 30s, and by the end of that decade, roughly 20 factories remained, and even fewer of those factories produced the handmade cigars Ybor was known for. The majority of the factories were now mechanized, which meant hundreds of people and thousands of people were out of work. My grandmother's Ebor, the Ebor of the Depression, was one of struggle and of hardship, but it was also a place where Latinas and where women took center stage and assumed great power. Unlike Ebor City during its heyday, during my grandmother's growing up, Ebor was a place where women were the primary workers within cigar factories. Women were the primary members of unions, and some even led labor unions. This was something that happened for the first time. While others became public voices who advocated on behalf of their husbands who needed access to New Deal work programs, but had been denied on account of their ethnicity, for some their race, and at times for others, the combination of both. The advocacy of these women came through appeals to city officials as mothers, wives, and daughters in the forms of petitions, protests, marches, and multi-day sit-down strikes. These women of Ebor argued for the need of a fair family wage, a term specific to the Depression that talked about where both partners had the ability to contribute and were not structurally restricted from doing so and sought to change the way the city of Tampa viewed immigrant and Latino workers in an era of Jim Crow, the era of segregation. This period of time wasn't necessarily something that my grandmother spoke fondly about, but it was something that she spoke about. I think there's something within that, right? All histories have a sense of understanding. They allow us to learn how to move forward and the lessons we take with us even when they conflict with what we wish they were. But right, to write this history, I couldn't just rely on what I thought I knew. I had to prove it. Right? 
The history I uncover in my book took years of research. And when I say years, I mean but years. Uh, it took over 10 years to get to the finish line of this, right? It took years of research and archives across the nation, and it required the generosity of women in Tampa. Past residents of Ybor agreed to sit down and share their memories with me, the process historians called doing oral history. The historian Nancy Hewitt, if anybody's read her book, Southern Discomfort, it is excellent. Nancy's also a great person. She provided me with the original tapes of oral history she conducted with Latinas from Ybor City during the 1980s that she never used in her book. And the tease tapes will soon be a part of the Nancy Hewitt collection at USF. For somebody to share the work that they did that was not yet archived, I can't say how unique that is. Right? Sharing the things that you find so that other people can write history about them is one of the most generous things that a scholar can do. Over the course of these 10 years, I traveled and researched in archives in Tampa, including the USF Special Collections and the archives of the city of Tampa. There's nobody in this room who was more helpful to me in finding those documents than Jennifer Dietz, who planned this event for seven years. Yeah. When I hit roadblocks during the pandemic, it was Jennifer who was scanning documents and sending them to me. Anything that I needed and anything that I asked for, she found a way to make it to me. And when we all think of the way that finding allies and finding ways to amplify each other in true and genuine and equitable ways matter whether or not you're receiving accommodation, Jennifer is such an example of that. I think about the start of my career. If you hadn't signed on that NEH grant, I wouldn't have gotten it. And who knows if I would have stood out in a pile of hundreds of applicants to become a professor. Right. So within the city of Tampa, I also went to Tallahassee, right, the state of Florida archives. I have spent time in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress, the National Archives and Records Administration, and at the University of Maryland, ironically enough, has a lot of information about Tampa. The documents I found transformed the stories I learned from my grandmother's memories to the story of a community and of its women. In this history, the women I write about, some were immigrants, others were US born. Many were mothers, thousands were activists, many were wives, some were craftsmen, and others were daughters. Women made their homes function, from cooking and cleaning, and others worked to make their lives better for their families as they organized in support of political causes, at times in overt ways and at others in more silent ways. EJ, I think of your mom when I think of that and all the things that she did during World War II. EJ Salcinas' mom, she used to let other women know, and she kind of led the charge when there was a telegram that came in notifying one of the other women in West Tampa that somebody's son had died. And she would rally a group of support that would bring meals and that would bring emotional support as well as financial support in the midst of World War II. Yeah. Yeah. Both she and you are in the book. So in this, in this environment, right, these women, they lived complex and complicated lives worth knowing in their entirety and within their contradictions. It is stories such as these that encourage all of us to rethink the roles women have played in local and in national histories. Florida is among the most diverse states in the U.S. South, let alone the entire nation. And women's histories from this state and from this city intersect with the stories of those who have migrated from every corner of the globe and sought to survive. These histories inform how we understand the impact of immigration policies, community building, and individual identities, how people build coalitions, and at times when people fight against each other. These stories intersect with the histories of those who have, with the sense of power to create a path forward that is transformative, equitable, at least if we allow it. My work to understand and write the history of Latinas from Ybor and introduce this history to a broader national audience is not something I relegate to my writing, but one that I seek to share with anyone who wishes to learn.
I like to think that I take after my grandmother in that way. <laughs> As I mentioned right, in the very gracious introduction, in addition to my book, I'm in the midst of an historic marker and historic mural project that seeks to identify Latina histories, women's histories, in Ybor City and celebrate through them through this marker and mural project. This project translates the research that I already did for my book through a form of what's called public history, a way that people can see and interact with things beyond the written page. In a moment when there is great change and development in the city of Tampa, projects like these call attention to the reality that Ebor and the women of that community were here and that they mattered. However, just like my book, none of this work was possible alone, but done in partnership with others, namely the city of Tampa Arts and Culture, the Gobioff Foundation, Daryl Shaw and Casa Ibor, the Cuban Club and the Silver Meteor Gallery, as well as support and approval of the project by the Hillsborough County Historical Advisory Council, a process that took over a year. <laughs> right. Our first marker and mural will be located on 7th Avenue in Ybor City on the YCDC building. And it celebrates a day in 1937 when 5,000 Latinas marched in protest of fascism abroad and its global power. To put this into perspective, that number is significant. The moment that we all remember in the history of suffrage is when, again, 5,000 women marched in protest in Washington, D.C. against the election of Woodrow Wilson, who was an anti-suffrage candidate. The number of women who protested similar ideals in Tampa is of the same number. And this moment and this march was the largest collective action of Latinas in US history until the early movements for immigration reform in the early 2000s. It would be my pleasure for you all to join us at the dedication. It'll happen in the morning on March 30th. I know Jennifer, I still have to make the invitation. And there will also be a broader event at the Cuban Club that evening. There are flyers advertising it on the back of, in the back of this room. Even if you all can't make it, as you walk down 7th Avenue and see the mural, I hope that you think of this talk and the women's lives who made all of this possible. After all, history of great importance can emerge from humble and very ordinary origins. But those origins do not mean that it's unimportant. Just as the stories I learned throughout my life that inspired me to question the people and places I hold most dear, I hope you take a second look at the stories that surround you. History is personal, and it lives within each and every woman in person in this room. Nobody has to be famous to be significant, and nobody has to be famous for their life to make history. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful speech and for illuminating this history that I think everybody should take the time to understand and learn because it is part of our community. You know, it's not unique to one community. It's something that matters to us all. So again, thank you for that. Well, with that, I want to say this has been such a wonderful morning. I'm so grateful that I've been invited to be here before you all and that I've had the opportunity to engage and share in all of these stories and to spend this time with everybody. Um, I want to thank all of our program sponsors and all of the participants. And we have a full list of everybody who helped make this possible in the back of your program today. We also want to thank the Mayor's Youth Corps and also to, yes, round of applause. We also want to thank Alisar, who was the violinist who provided some of that lovely music prior to the program. And again, a special thanks to the Tampa Police Department Honor Guard and the Tampa Fire Rescue Hometown Heroes Chorus. They were so wonderful. <laughs> I also want to say that we would not be here today if it were not for the hard work and dedication of the members of the Women's History Month Committee. So would all committee members please stand for a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.
thank each and every one of you for your service. I also want to say, you know, it's not just women in the room today. I see a lot of gentlemen out there. I want to thank all the men for supporting women, <laughs> for seeing this as a worthy cause to support. One more thing to say, during March, you can take part in helping women re-enter the workforce. This is very important. You can donate clean, gently worn suits, work attire, and accessories. They're being collected for the Dress for Success organization. They have done some amazing work in this community. The Women's History Committee is also having a feminine hygiene product drive to benefit homeless girls and women. And for more information on both of those programs, there's stuff on the back tables back there. And also throughout March, there's going to be a women's history display in the mascot room of Old City Hall. So make sure you take a few moments to take in that display. So with that, again, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for having me here today and for being a part of this celebration. And I hope that we all, as we go forward, continue to honor the sacrifices and the contributions of women to our society. Thank you. Thank you.